Let me just introduce our first speaker. Um, so Nisarg is somebody who knows this place very well. He did his B.Tech in CSE from IIT Bombay in 2011. Um, he was also the presidential gold medalist at the time, which means that he had the highest GPA in his batch at the time of graduation. Um, he went on to do his PhD at CMU, where he also won the, the Victor Lesser Award for Distinguished Dissertation. His work, um, his work spans many fields, but one of the interesting things about his work is that um, he's also put into applications. So there are at least two particular um, applications that I know of, Split It and RoboVote, where his work is being used um, every day you know, by people to divide things, to figure out better ways to vote. Um, he's an assistant professor at University of Toronto, and uh, I'm very glad that he could join us today. So. All right. <coughs> Okay, so uh, uh, the topic that I'm going to talk about is uh, communication distortion trade-off in voting. And so as you can see from the name in the title, uh, this is going to be about communication complexity and its application to voting theory. And this is uh, based on uh, joint work with a few of my collaborators, uh, Debmalia Mandal, who is a postdoc at Columbia Data Science Institute, uh, Ariel Prokacha, who is, uh, an assist uh, who is a professor at uh, Carnegie Mellon, uh, is now going to move to Harvard and uh, David Woodruff, who is also a professor at Carnegie Mellon. Okay, so the, the topic of this talk is voting. And as many of you know, the roots of voting go back to the, the, rise, of, uh, uh, the rise of democracy in ancient Greece. And, uh, but voting has also been studied formally uh, for many uh, centuries, uh, starting from the uh, uh, work of philosopher Ramon Lull, whose uh, lost manuscripts were discovered in uh, 2001, and since then he has been credited for discovering uh, uh, some of the, for first discovering some of the popular voting methods like board account or Condorcet method, for those of you who might know this. And uh, uh, from there, all the way to uh, the work of uh, Marquis de Condorcet in the late 18th century, to the celebrated work of uh, Nobel Prize winning uh, Kenneth Arrow in the 20th century. Right, so uh, all the way to the work of uh, Kenneth Arrow in the 20th century. And so across this entire sort of centuries worth of research on voting, there was one model of voting that was uh, pretty uh, common. Uh, and I would even go for as far as to say that this is the, the canonical model of voting that was studied. Uh, and my apologies to any approval or range voting fans uh, in the audience. Uh, and this is the, the model known as ranked voting. And so in this model, you have a bunch of voters. And these voters are represented by these black silhouettes here. And these voters have ranked preferences over a set of candidates. And so here we have the red candidate, the blue candidate, and the, the, uh, the green candidate. And each voter has a, uh, a rank preference over these candidates. So for example, voter one prefers the red candidate more than the green, more than the blue candidate. Uh, whereas voter two has a slightly different preference. Uh, she might prefer uh, the blue candidate over the green, over the red. And when you actually conduct voting, uh, all these uh, voters are uh, going to simply report their rank preference. Uh, and these preferences are going to be aggregated by a voting rule, uh, F, uh, which is going to aggregate these rankings to select a single candidate as the winner of the election. Okay. So this is the model that people studied for many centuries. And one question that voting theorists uh, sort of tried really hard to answer is, how do we compare two different voting rules that aggregate these sort of rankings uh, into a single uh, winning candidate. And one method that received a lot of attention in the literature was this axiomatic method, which essentially uh, uh, here we, we try to define a few natural axioms that we would want our voting rules to satisfy. And then uh, we would try to search for voting rules that are in the intersection of all of these uh, axioms, which means that they satisfy all the axioms at the same time. Okay, so this was the hope. Uh, but many of the celebrated results on this line of work actually uh, derive impossibility results, which mean that they actually show that for many natural combinations of these axioms, there isn't any voting rule that satisfies all of them at the same time. So this, uh, 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 this method uh, does not give us sort of a unique voting rule to, to use in, in practical uh, situations, right? It doesn't answer this question that if I have these ranked preferences, what is the best way to aggregate these ranked preferences into a single winning candidate? Now, while uh, this, this uh, so with the rise of uh, computer science influence in voting theory and, and with the, the rise of computational social choice, uh, there was another uh, approach to voting that, that was uh, picking up steam. And this approach is called implicit utilitarian voting, 
So this is so. Let's go back to this picture where we have this rank preferences that this voting rule aggregates into a winning candidate. But now this approach says that these voters don't really have rank preferences underneath. They actually have numerical utilities for the different candidates uh, underneath. Uh, but they're still going to they're still going to report the rank preferences. So whenever I mention this, uh, immediately people start asking questions. What does these utilities even mean? Uh, we don't have any money in the system uh, in this particular context. So what is even the scale of these utilities? Why is this 7 to 1 instead of, uh, say, 700, 200, and 100? And indeed, there is no absolute scale of the utilities in this, um, in this moneyless system. Uh, so really, what these numbers re uh, represent is the relative in intensity of the preference of a voter for one candidate over another. So for example, voter 2 here uh, is relatively indifferent between the, the green and the, uh, the orange candidate. Here it's orange. In my slide, it's red. Uh, and uh, but but slightly prefers uh, the blue candidate over the green candidate, uh, whereas for voter one, uh, he substantially prefers the green candidate over the blue, and even more so uh, the red over the uh, the green. Okay. And so these are really just trying to represent the intensity of the preference. So you can think of them as ratios as well, if you if you prefer. Okay, or I can I can just normalize the sum of all these values to one to make sure that they are on the same scale. You can think of uh, giving a dollar to each voter and asking them to divide this dollar between the different candidates in proportion to how much they like the different candidates. So as you can see, the voting rule is still the same. Uh, the voting rule still essentially aggregates these rankings into a single alternative. But now that we have this underlying numerical information, we can try and ask uh, how good is this voting rule. So we need an objective measure uh, to, to, uh, that the voting rule should, uh, in principle, maximize. And one measure that is very common, but you don't always have to go by this measure, is the social welfare, which is the sum of the uh, utilities to different voters given by each candidate. So if you look at the sum of the utilities for the red candidate, uh, then that would be 1.5. Uh, the sum of the utilities for the blue candidate here is 1. And for the green candidate, it's 0.5. So our voting rule doesn't see this information, but it makes some decision. And then you can ask uh, for this decision, what is the ratio between the highest social welfare that I could have guaranteed uh, versus the social welfare that my voting rule generates? Okay, and this ratio in this context is 1.5 divided by 1. Uh, but of course, this is for this, these particular set of numbers. Our voting rule doesn't actually see these numbers. So any numbers that are consistent with these rankings uh, could potentially be the underlying numerical preferences of the voters. So what we want to do here is we want to look at all possible sets of numbers that, that the voters could have that could generate these rankings. And across all, the, all those sets of numbers, we want to look at the worst case ratio of the social welfare that our voting rule guarantees. And this is what's known as the distortion in this line of work. So this approach uh, gives a different way of viewing what a voting rule is trying to do. And uh, it does require you to make a few subjective assumptions. Uh, so for example, it does require you to assume that the voters do have these numerical utilities underneath their rank preferences. And it does require you to assume that you are trying to maximize some sort of objective function. Here, for example, the social welfare. And it also requires you to assume that when you cannot maximize the social welfare function, because you don't know these utilities, you want to go for the best worst case approximation ratio, okay, which is a very standard concept in theoretical computer science. But it does require you to make those uh, assumptions. But once you make these three assumptions, the nice thing about this approach is that it gives you a single uh, uniquely optimal voting rule to use. And this is the voting rule that is going to minimize this so-called distortion on every possible uh, rank preference profile that it sees. So this is a, a relatively recent development in voting theory. And uh, while this was going on, there was another development that was also going on which is that people were starting to look at applications of voting beyond just uh, political elections, beyond the standard uh, scenario where you have uh, M candidates and you want to select one of them. In the previous setting, uh, did you also assume that the number of players has some, uh, number of candidates has a bound or something like that? Uh, so there are M candidates. Uh, there is no, I mean, yeah, it's just there are some N voters, there are some M candidates, and each voter has some numerical utility functions over the candidates. And at least three or three? Uh, yeah, if there are two candidates, then, then there is the majority is, uh, 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 yeah, it's the optimal rule. So yeah, it only becomes interesting for three or more. OK, so as I was saying, that people also started looking at applications of voting in some other context. And one such context was participatory budgeting. So this is a very popular paradigm. For those of you who may not have heard it, I'll just give a brief overview. 
So it's a paradigm whereby a city uh, sets aside some uh, portion of the public budget to, to fund some public projects. So if, if, if the residents want a certain park to be built in a the neighborhood, then uh, the, these, this money can be used for that purpose. And the key distinction is that we want to allocate this money based on the preferences of the residents rather than uh, some uh, city officials making the decisions by themselves. Okay, and this, this paradigm has been used already to allocate hundreds of millions of dollars uh, of public money uh, just in North America alone, and, but it is a, a worldwide phenomenon. And so for example, uh, you have this, uh, so this symbolic city here, and the city has uh, three different projects. So that, uh, that you could build a skyscraper, and this project has a cost of four in some units. Uh, and there is a voter, and this voter has utility six for this particular project. There is another project which is repairing the roads. Uh, this has co a, a small cost of one and a, a smaller utility of two for this voter. And a third project which is to build a park, uh, and this has cost three and utility three. So one thing that people realized when looking at this, uh, this context is that there isn't just a single kind of question, uh, uh, there isn't a the unique kind of question that we might want to ask voters uh, to, to get their preferences as input. For example, uh, you can just do the standard thing that we have been doing, uh, which is do, to ask voters to rank these different projects and rank the projects by their utility. Right? So you can ask the voters to just ignore the cost of the projects and just ask them to rank the projects by the utilities. And in this case, uh, the, 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 this particular voter would say that uh, he prefers uh, being, building the skyscraper uh, more than uh, building the park, more than building, uh, repairing the roads. But as you can see that this is more like a multi-agent knapsack problem. So taking inspiration from the optimal knapsack solution, you might also want to ask voters to rank the projects by their uh, bank for buck or value uh, divided by the cost. Okay? And so if the voter does this, then the voter would provide a different ranking where uh, the repairing the roads has this ratio of two is to one. Uh, uh, this is better than the, the ratio for the skyscraper, which is 1.5, which is better than the ratio for the park, which is one. Right, so, so these utilities are going to change for the different voters, uh, but the costs are going to be the same. Yeah. Uh, another uh, approach that uh, came up in uh, work of Ashish Goel at Stanford is they looked at this knapsack voting, where you ask, you show the total budget to each voter, and then you ask this voter to solve their own knapsack problem, which is that if you had the control over this entire budget, which subset of projects would you execute? And so in this case, the voter would uh, think about uh, implementing the skyscraper versus repairing the roads and building the parks at the same time. And since uh, six is more than two plus three, they would actually vote for building the skyscraper. Another, uh, uh, another input format that came across and that, that came up in uh, one of my work with my collaborators is this threshold approval voting, where you ask voters, for example, uh, approve all the projects uh, that you like uh, at, at level at least 10% of your total happiness for all the projects. So if you had to divide a dollar between all the projects, up, select all the projects that would receive at least 10 cents. And in this case, if this threshold turns out to be, let's say, three in this particular normalization, then the voter would approve uh, the skyscraper and the park. So as you can see, the, the important uh, takeaway here is that in this context, there isn't a single kind of question uh, that, that we might want to ask. There isn't a canonical question that you might want to ask. There are all these different questions that make sense. And uh, we wanted to see sort of how do you compare these different kind of input formats. And so one nice thing that this uh, implicit utilitarian voting approach gives us is that it not only allows us to compare different voting rules that all take in ranked preferences as input and output a single candidate, but they also allow us to compare two different voting rules that take different kind of preferences as input. Right? So you can, you can compare a voting rule that takes rankings by value as input against a voting rule that takes knapsack votes as input. And, and in fact, you can go beyond that. You can even assign a distortion for each input format. So you can say that if I have rankings by value, I'm going to aggregate it using the best possible aggregation rule that minimizes my distortion. And I'm going to look at the smallest distortion that I can achieve. And here, this turns out to be uh, roughly square root of m up to log factors. You can similarly assign a distortion for ranking by value for money, which is also square root of m. Uh, you can show that knapsack voting has exponential distortion, uh, and threshold approval voting has logarithmic distortion. So, so here, you can essentially assign this single number to each input format, and that, in some sense, tries to convey how much information is contained in responses in this particular format, which is useful for maximizing social welfare. So this is good. But certainly, 
comparing these input formats on just this one number each does not really make sense because if you wanted to minimize your distortion then you would just ask voters to report their exact utility functions right and, and then you would be able to get distortion 1. So the reason we are not doing that is because th there is this implicit notion of cognitive burden. Uh, we think that asking voters to report this direct sort of intensities of preferences is cognitively very burdensome. So of course we want to compare these different input methods not only based on the distortion that they help achieve but also based on the cognitive burden that they impose. Okay. And this is not uh, a very easy thing to measure the, the cognitive burden imposed by a certain kind of question on the voters. And this suddenly requires many different perspectives. Uh, it, it requires you to think of like the psychological perspective, the sociological perspective. And so, so we, we are not going to answer this question completely in this, uh, in this work that I'm going to describe. But here what we did is we just took a very, very crude measure of cognitive burden, which is the number of bits that a voter needs to communicate to your voting rule to, to convey the preferences in that certain format. So suddenly, as I said, the number of bits is not the right measure of cognitive burden, it's just the first step. Okay. But if you go by this measure of cognitive burden, then you can now ask this very interesting conceptual question, which is that if I am willing to ask each voter for just k bits of information about uh, her valuation function, then how much uh, can I minimize my distortion? And also, what is the right set of questions that I want to ask uh, subject to this budget of k bits of information? What is the, the optimal uh, ballot look like? Yeah. Okay, so any questions so far on the conceptual framework? You don't consider incentive compatibility here, right? Right. So and they report the kind of the, what, what the report will be kind of uh, you design what they will. Right. So that that's right. So so in this work, I'm not going to look at uh, incentive compatibility. I'm not going to look at strategic manipulations. Turns out that this, uh, this approach of implicit utilitarian voting actually blends very well with, uh, uh, very well with uh, incentive compatibility. So Umang uh, uh, actually has some work on uh, looking at uh, uh, strategy proof voting rules and, and it turns out that you actually don't lose distortion very much if you impose strategy proofness as well. Of course, uh, uh, we haven't looked at it in this framework. Uh, it has been looked at in the original standard framework where your, uh, your preferences are ranked preferences. But that's, that's a very interesting direction for the future. Okay, so at this point, just to formalize the model a bit more, uh, we have a set of voters uh, that I'm going to represent by capital N and the individual voters by one through small n. You have a set of alternatives that I'm going to denote by capital A and there are M alternatives. And each voter, as I mentioned, has a valuation function which assigns a non-negative real value to each alternative. And as I said, I'm going to normalize all the voter valuations so that they sum to one so this vi is essentially going to be a vector in the m-dimensional space that adds up to 1. So it's going to be in the m-simplex. And given these valuations, you can define the social welfare of each alternative, which is just the sum of the values that it gives to different voters. And one nice thing uh, that comes up in when we think of this voting rule as sort of designing the ballot and uh, designing the ways to aggregate responses to that ballot is that voting rule is not just one function anymore, it's actually a combination of two different functions. So there is, a, uh, there is an elicitation rule in there, uh, which maps uh, all the possible valuations uh, from the m simplex to some finite response space. So uh, just think of r as some finite set. So this, this function essentially tells each voter that if this is your particular valuation function, then this is the response that you should provide to me. Okay. And the number of bits that the voter needs to communicate to provide this response is the log of the, the size of this space. So that is the, the elicitation rule and the aggregation rule takes all of these responses that it receives from all the different voters uh, and selects a single alternative as the winner. So one key thing to note here is that the ballot is the same for all the voters. So once you decide how the voters should respond, uh, it's the same ballot that every voter is answering. You can think about asking different, different questions to different voters and it turns out that you can minimize distortion pretty quickly if you are willing to do that. But this is still a very realistic, uh, 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 sort of a realistic domain where you want all the voters to answer the same ballot. And here I've defined these rules to be deterministic. You can also allow each rule to be uh, deterministic or randomized. So you can pick this uh, mapping from the m simplex to finite response space at random or you can also have this aggregation rule return a distribution over alternatives. Yeah. Randomized 
voters have access to random coins? No, so, so we don't, in, in our framework, we don't look at voters who have access to random coins. What we do is that uh, if, you are, if you want to randomize your elicitation rule, then you can essentially pick this function at random. So uh, before, uh, before you send it to the voters, so you pick a random ballot and then you send this ballot to all the voters and the voters uh, res respond to this ballot and those responses are deterministic. Uh, and then you can sort of aggregate these responses maybe in a randomized fashion where you output instead of, sing instead of outputting a single alternative, you output a distribution over alternatives. But how do you get most of communication to the voters say what is the what does the ballot look like? Right, so, so yeah, so this doesn't count the, the cost of conveying the ballot to the voters. So uh, this is sort of inspired from this, uh, sort of this, this imagination that, that you, can, you, can, you can have this ballot printed and the ballot is already right there. There is a cost to training voters to understand what this ballot is trying to ask them. Uh, and so that we, we also did some human subject experiment where we looked at both the, the time that it takes voters to understand the ballot and then the time that it takes voters to answer the ballot. Uh, and so, yeah, so I'll talk about uh, that a little bit at the end. It's the same like process. As in, you just, it's not like round, you don't want to do this in multiple rounds. As in, you ask for some legs and then. Right. So, so uh, one thing that we don't want, I mean, we, we essentially are restricting to do is we want to, to conduct this election in the standard uh, way where uh, everyone answers the ballot in one round and then uh, uh, the responses are aggregated. Uh, even if you do it in multiple rounds, as long as you don't uh, rely on the responses of one voter to ask a different question to another voter, uh, then you can essentially simulate this multi-round thing in a single round where you can essentially ask for the entire tree uh, of, of possible responses. Uh, but, but yeah, uh, so yeah, so there is a nice question as to what you can do with adaptive elicitation uh, that we leave for future work. But just to check, like, one thing you can't do is like a randomized threshold thing. That the voting mechanism crosses the point and asks the voter for it. You can. Uh, you can't just do a different threshold for each voter. Oh, the guy you can't. Yeah. Okay. Right. But you can still randomly pick the threshold, and then you can convey the same threshold to everyone. Okay. That is now what the ballot looks like. All right. Great set of questions. Okay. So going back to this framework, now uh, what this looks like is that the voters have these utility functions. They come to this uh, voting method. They see the ballot. And the, this ballot essentially tells them how to convey, con convert their numerical valuation function to a response. And then these responses are aggregated by an aggregation rule uh, to select a single winning candidate. Okay. And here we are going to measure a voting rule on two different aspects. We are going to look at the communication complexity of the voting rule, which is the expected number of bits that a voter needs to send. And the expectation here is only if you randomize your elicitation rule, if you are randomizing your ballot design, uh, then uh, this is going to be expectation, otherwise it's going to be deterministic. And the distortion is the, the, the notion that I already mentioned, which is the worst case over all possible valuations that the voter could have. Uh, the ratio of the maximum social welfare that you could achieve if you knew these valuations and picked the right alternative, divided by the expected social welfare that, that is achieved by the, the, the winning candidate selected by your voting rule. Uh, and this expectation is over uh, randomization in the aggregation rule part. All right, so uh, what we are interested in is uh, looking at the Pareto frontier between these two different metrics. Uh, and so we are interested in the kind of questions that say, uh, if I limit the communication complexity to k bits, what is the minimum distortion that I can get? Or if I want to get a distortion of at most d, what is the minimum communication complexity that I need? And in, in this sequence of works, we uh, perfectly uh, identify the Pareto frontier. Okay, so just to give you a, a bit of context, so there were some, when we started this project, there were some rules in the, in the literature for which this, uh, these comparisons were known. So for example, if you ask people to communicate rankings, then that takes m log m bits to communicate, uh, order m log m bits to communicate. And it was known that if you do deterministic aggregation, then you can get uh, theta of m squared distortion. If you do randomized aggregation, you can get roughly theta of square root m distortion. All of these tildes are going to hide log or uh, sub-logarithmic factors. And if you do uh, threshold approval votes, then this has communication complexity m because you are approving or disapproving each uh, alternative. So it's a, an m bit uh, elicitation method and it allows you to get, uh, 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 with randomized aggregation, you can get log square m distortion. Okay? So it turns out that when you optimize your ballot design, you can actually Pareto dominate all of these known, uh, uh, known uh, trade-offs. Okay? So you can, you can get voting rules 
that have better communication complexity and better distortion even with deterministic aggregation uh, than both rankings and threshold approval votes and also other known methods. Okay, so let me start a little bit, uh, uh, let me talk a little bit about the, the techniques and the results. And so here I want to focus not so much on the results but more on the, the techniques that we are using. Uh, but I am still going to describe uh, some of the voting rules that, that derive our upper bounds uh, a bit informally. So when you want to do a deterministic elicitation, so when you want to pick your ballot deterministically, then we propose this uh, pref, uh, pref threshold voting rule which essentially intuitively does something very simple. It asks each voter i to report her top order m over d most favorite alternatives. So here my goal is to achieve distortion d. And for doing that, I'm going to ask each voter to report uh, her top order M over D alternatives and also give me some estimate of her value for this alternative, not uh, exactly conveying this value, but rather picking uh, this value from one of less, let's say some, some logarithmic many, many buckets. So essentially you can think of this as voter essentially picking whether uh, her value for each of these alternatives is very low, low, high or very high. And then the aggregation rule essentially converts uh, each of these estimates uh, in, into, uh, uh, sums up each of these estimates to come up with an estimated social welfare of each alternative and then just picks an alternative, alternative that maximizes social welfare, okay, so an estimated social welfare. And so it, I'm not going into the detail of how you do this, but this is very simple. You can look at the paper for this. But uh, for this, you can show that this has communication complexity, which is roughly order M over D because reporting this set of m over d alternatives takes uh, roughly m over d uh, many bits up to log factors and also uh, uh, picking the right of the log m buckets uh, also takes essentially uh, roughly m over d, d bits uh, up to log factors. Yeah. And for this you can show that the distortion is now order d. Yeah. With respect to all, yeah. All right. So, so now uh, it turns out that when you try to extend this technique, uh, this very simple, very intuitive technique to uh, randomized elicitation, it does not work well. It gives us uh, a bound something like m over d squared uh, for the communication complexity to get distortion d, but it doesn't give us the optimal bound. And to derive the optimal bound, we had to make a connection to the literature on uh, sketching and sampling in the streaming algorithms literature. Uh, so this is from theoretical computer science where the idea is that you are going to see a stream of updates and uh, you, you want to sort of process all these updates but you don't want to store uh, the full information. So think of sort of receiving a, a vector x but receiving it in parts where you receive vector x1, x2, dot 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 xn and then vector x is just the addition of these vectors. Now at each point you could, when you receive this x1 and x2 and so on, you can just store the current sum uh, until now. But if this vector is m-dimensional, then you are essentially going to uh, use space that is proportional to m. Whereas uh, what these algorithms try to do is that they try to use sublinear space. And with uh, storing some sublinear uh, amount of information, they want to perform some operation at the end on the entire vector x. Okay, so this could be uh, frequency estimation. This could be sampling uh, uh, an element at random, things like this. And so there was this notion of perfect LP, LP samplers uh, in this line of work that was defined by uh, one of my collaborators, uh, David Woodruff, and uh, uh, his collaborator uh, in 2010. And the idea of a perfect LP, LP sampler is that once it stops uh, processing all these updates, it wants to output with probability at least 1 minus delta uh, a random coordinate j hat of this vector such that each coordinate j is sampled with probability proportional to the pth power of the value of x at that coordinate. Okay, so imagine that this uh, x1 through xn are essentially frequencies of different, uh, all these m different m elements. Then at the end, you want to sample each element with probability proportional to the pth power of the number of times that that element has appeared in the stream. Okay. And of course, you want to do that without actually storing the number of times that that element has appeared in the stream because you don't want to use too much space. And uh, here, of course, we are going to allow some small additive error uh, in this probability uh, sampling. So the way that we connected this to voting is that you can view all of these xi's as the different valuations v1 through vn. And then the x vector just becomes a social welfare function. And if you, so, so at first, sort of this kind of sampling seems unrelated to the, 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 the task that we have at hand, which is to select the coordinate that has the highest value in this social welfare function. 
Rather, we are selecting each coordinate at random with probability proportional to the pth power uh, of its value. And it turns out that if you can sample uh, an alternative with probability proportional to the square of its social welfare, then I can actually use that to derive the optimal voting rule. And so, uh, in particular, we use this perfect L2 sampler uh, that was uh, derived by Jairam, Jairam and Woodruff, I, I believe, in a stock 18 paper. Uh, and this L L2 sampler, in addition to having this uh, definition, in, in addition to meeting this definition, it also uses so-called linear sketches, which means that if I use some sort of small uh, representation of each of the Xi's, I can just add up those small representations. This is what the linear means, to get a small representation of X. And in addition to doing that, it not only produces a random coordinate j hat, it also produces an estimate of x of j hat. Okay? And that is very useful in our reduction. So it's also going to produce an estimate of the social welfare of the random alternative that it returns. Okay, so just to sort of look at at the high level how our voting rule uses this, uh, this perfect LP sampler, it so here I have listed this more, more or less in a black box manner due to some subtle, uh, 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 some subtle uh, points. We cannot actually use this sampler in a black box manner. We have to sort of unroll it within our voting rule, but I am not going to go over that. So the elicitation rule is very simple. Uh, each voter i first of all rounds his sort of numerical valuation function to some discrete uh, point. So essentially you take each value for each alternative and you round it to some nearest multiple of 1 over delta, where delta is some small constant. And then uh, it takes this particular rounded valuation and it sends many, many independent sketches of this, uh, uh, this rounded valuation. So there are, in particular, we are going to ask for order m over d cube many sketches uh, of this rounded valuation. And uh, uh, these are sort of linear sketches that this aggregation rule can aggregate from all the different voters. It can obtain order m over d cube many sketches of the social welfare function, and then by choosing the best of these uh, different alternatives that are returned by the different self samplers, uh, where the best is defined by the estimates that are produced by the samplers themselves. So each sampler gives us a random alternative uh, which, that is sampled with probability proportional to the square of its welfare, and an estimate of the social welfare of that alternative. And we can pick the best of these, and we can show that that gives us this order D distortion. And uh, based because of the small uh, uh, the small space complexity required for each of these sketches, uh, you essentially only need uh, roughly m over d cube uh, uh, space com uh, uh, communication complexity. Right. So, so this is a randomized elicitation where the randomness was in choosing the different sketch functions, and then you send all these sketch functions to the voters, and they compute the sketches of their particular rounded valuations, and they send it back to you. So here you are concerned the randomness complexity. So the universe of uh, uh, m by uh, some uh, uh, polylog m matrices. Uh, so yeah, it's. Uh, yeah, the, you, you still need polynomially many bits of randomness, uh, but, but yeah, that's a very interesting point, uh, which is that how many bits of randomness were required to actually generate this ballot. Yeah. Yeah, so that's something that we don't consider into account uh, in this framework, at least not so far. I mean, the delta is like a, a small constant. Uh, you, uh, it's something like 1 over 128 or something. It's just enough that everything works out and you get this order D distortion at the end. Yeah, you can look at the paper for the exact constant, but yeah, some something that's small enough. Just to check for this. Yeah. So this, this to check for this works. I mean, so so the so the mechanism passes a bunch of random points. Uh, this is put in the ballot, so everybody sees, and then they generate these these sketches, and then mm -hmm. each of them sends back. Right. Yeah. So it goes in the other direction as well, like sketching lower bound actually. So I'm going to say something about that at the uh, uh, in a few slides. Okay, so uh, so so far uh, I showed you that with uh, uh, deterministic elicitation you can get distortion D with m over D uh, communication complexity. With randomized elicitation you can get the same thing with much smaller number of bits uh, using only m over D cube bits. Okay, and I did not mention anything about whether the aggregation rule is deterministic or randomized. It turns out that you can achieve both of these with deterministic aggregation rule. But I'm going to show matching lower bounds that hold even for randomized aggregation. So it turns out that when you you are already sort of uh, 
uh, once, you once you fix whether your elicitation rule is going to be deterministic or randomized, whether you do a randomized aggregation or a deterministic aggregation does not really change uh, uh, things. Okay, so let me say a few things about the lower bounds that we, uh, the matching lower bounds that we get, and here we make connections to the um, uh, the communication complexity literature within theoretical computer science. Uh, in particular, we look at this multi-party set disjointness problem, uh, and the problem is as follows: so you have a universe of m elements, and there are some t players, and each player holds a subset of this uh, universe uh, privately. And these, uh, these players are trying to solve some joint uh, problem of uh, their private inputs. Uh, so in this particular case, they are trying to figure out whether their sets uh, have a common intersection or not. Okay. And typically, these problems are studied under some kind of promise. So there is some third entity that gives you this promise that the only kind of instances that you are going to see are these two kind of instances. You can either have a no instance where all these sets are pairwise disjoint, or you can have a yes instance where there is an element that appears in every set and other than that element all the sets are pairwise disjoint. Any other third kind of instance you would never see that. Okay? Or if you see that you can output anything arbitrary on that instance it does not really matter. And the question is uh, once you know that you are only going to see one of these two types of instances how many bits do the players need to exchange in order to figure out which instance they are part of. Okay? Of course they can just uh, declare their entire sets uh, but, but you want to do something uh, hopefully smaller than that. And the way this uh, framework is usually analyzed is that you have this each voter uh, or each player having this set of uh, elements and they write uh, some bits uh, according to some protocol on a shared blackboard. So each voter, each uh, player essentially sees what the other players are writing and when the protocol says that now they need to write something, they go and write uh, whatever the protocol is asking them to write on this shared blackboard and at the end they need to compute whether the answer is a yes instance or a no instance. Okay. And the, the communication complexity measured here is the total number of bits that must be written on the shared blackboard before these players can figure out uh, the right answer. Okay. So here it is the total number of bits. In our voting problem we have number of bits communicated by each voter. So there is a slight difference but it does not really uh, uh, hurt us too much. So one thing that we had to do is we had to define a slight variant of this problem. We had to define a fixed set, size set disjointness problem where you require further that each of these players have a set of a fixed size say s uh, uh, in their mind and now they are trying to solve the same problem. And then we use this uh, lower bound on the communication complexity for disjointness with uh, m elements and t players. So in 2009 a couple of independent papers established that the any under any randomized protocol that outputs the right answer with high probability players must exchange uh, omega of m over t bits uh, to find out the right answer and using that we showed that uh, when you impose this fixed size s as long as s is smaller than uh, uh, m over t uh, uh, your protocol would require omega of s bits exchange from the players uh, in total. So this is more like a refined version of this result. And then we use this result in turn to, to reduce to the voting problem and so essentially we show that if you have a voting rule that achieves distortion d with fewer than m over d square bits uh, per voter uh, in case of deterministic elicitation or fewer than m over d cube bits per voter in case of randomized elicitation then you can actually construct a protocol for f disjointness uh, the fixed size set disjointness uh, that solves in less than s many bits and you can derive a contradiction. Uh, just a question, see what I'm missing. So th there was a question about uh, iterated communication and you said that it's Right. So al almost right. So so you are right that these results actually allow uh, for many rounds of communication. Uh, so these results are pretty general, and it turns out that when you look at our reduction, our reduction works for any voting protocol where I am. So it's a, it's a bit difficult to explain, but essentially I am only allowed to ask two different questions to di two different voters when they have already given a different response in the past. So when I start out I need to ask all the voters the same question but then some of these voters are going to give response 1, some of these voters are going to give response 2. Now among all the voters who give response 2 I cannot ask different questions, I need to ask them the same question but I can ask them a different question than I ask to the, the people who gave response 1. So as long as you only distinguish uh, between voters when they give different responses then the reduction works and then these bounds still hold. Uh, but if you are willing to ask different questions to different voters from the very uh, start, uh, 
then this reduction doesn't work. Okay, so there is this slight technical open question as to how to actually make the reduction work even when you are willing to ask different questions to different voters. But another interesting thing here is that this is actually not tight. So, so this is tight, right? For randomized elicitation, our upper bound was m over d cube, and this is exactly what the lower bound says. But for deterministic elicitation, this is a bit loose. And to get a tight bound there, we had to define a different kind of promise, where in the yes instance, you know uh, very sort of essentially much less structure about the instance. And so you are only told that there is some element that appears in at least some, some gamma fraction of the player's sets. And uh, for this, we showed that if you have this promise, uh, and if you have a deterministic protocol uh, that solves the, the question under this promise, then you actually need m bits of uh, communication between the players, uh, which is a, an improvement from this omega of s, which, is, uh, which was same as omega of m over t uh, previously. Uh, so if we improve this by a factor of t here, and that actually improves our communication lower bound uh, to m over t. So, uh, so this is sort of the summary that for getting distortion D, the best you can do with deterministic elicitation is exchange M over D bits with randomized elicitation M over D cube bits. And the key sort of moral of the story here is that uh, there is this nice connection between the literature on voting to the literature on communication complexity and to the literature on streaming algorithms. And in particular with communication complexity, it's a two directional bridge. So not only were we able to utilize results from communication complexity, deriving new results on voting required deriving new results on this communication complexity uh, literature. So introducing this fixed size set disjointness problem and also introducing this uh, substantial intersection promise. Uh, with uh, streaming algorithms, so far we have only used uh, results from streaming algorithms to derive voting rules. Uh, as Sid mentioned, it sort of remains to be seen whether you can actually use voting rules to derive new streaming algorithms as well. Okay, I just want to mention a couple of things about uh, a generalization that we also studied, where instead of selecting one alternative, you want to select a committee of K alternatives, right? So you want to elect a committee of candidates, and this is a very well studied problem in voting. One thing that you need to define is how is a voter going to value a committee of candidates? So we have this valuation function which assigns a utility of a voter for each individual candidate. And there are multiple ways to, to extend this to define values over committees of candidate. Uh, one is to just take the sum of the values for the different candidates in the committee. And it turns out that this actually has a very simple reduction to the winner selection problem because essentially your selection of candidates in the committee becomes almost independent. You just want to select the K candidates with the highest social welfare in your committee. So the more interesting variant is where uh, the value of a voter for a committee is the maximum value that the voter has for any candidate in the committee. So essentially a voter is trying to find the closest candidate that represents uh, me and I'm going to derive my value from this particular representative. Okay. And this makes the problem more like a coverage problem where if you have already selected one candidate that represents this subset of the voters, then you want to select another candidate that represents this other subset of voters and give them, uh, gives them very high value so that all the voters have high value. And uh, the, the social welfare of a, a committee of candidates is, again, just the sum of the values that this uh, committee provides to different voters. So here, it turns out that if you want to, uh, so here, again, the question is, can, uh, what, what, how much communication do we need from the voters to get distortion D? And before I mention the results, uh, one thing that, uh, that, that comes up is that it's not quite clear whether this problem becomes easier or harder as you increase k. So certainly if you can select more candidates in your committee, then you can give higher welfare to all the people, right? Because you can just take your previous committee, you can add another candidate, now everyone's value can only increase. But then uh, on the other hand, the, the optimal committee of k candidates, when you have a larger k, that bar is also going hard, higher because the optimal committee also gives higher value to all the candidates. So when you are trying to compete against the optimal, whether that approximation ratio goes up or down when you increase k isn't clear a priori. But it turns out uh, uh, from uh, our analysis that essentially uh, the problem does get easier with k. In particular, if you want to select a committee of size k, then uh, with deterministic elicitation, uh, you need m over kd uh, bits from each voter. With randomized elicitation, you need m over kd cube bits uh, from each voter. I'm 
uh, this again uses more connections to, to uh, streaming algorithms and, and communication uh, complexity lower bounds that I am not going to elaborate on. But essentially both these bounds uh, decrease uh, linearly uh, as, as k uh, goes high. Okay, so with that I want to just say a few words about uh, the kind of directions in which this kind of work takes us in the future. So the first direction is that we certainly need better models uh, of cognitive burden. As I said uh, initially the number of bits that I need to ask from each voter is a very crude measure. Uh, so with some other uh, set of collaborators uh, we also ran some preliminary human subject experiments to measure the cognitive burden imposed by different uh, kind of input formats for a participatory budgeting kind of uh, domain. And one thing that we found is that the cognitive difficulty does roughly match the number of bits. So for example, we found that uh, ranking, uh, 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 we found that uh, ranking by uh, value and value for money were very difficult for the voters and threshold approval, which, which is m log m bits and threshold approval and uh, knapsack votes were both slightly easier for the voters, which is m bits and then uh, k approval votes, which is even simpler, uh, were the simplest for the voters to answer. But of course it doesn't match exactly, for example, both ranking by value and value for money, they both have m log m bits of information contained in them, but for voters it was much more difficult to answer uh, questions of uh, ranking projects by value for money than uh, just by the value. Another thing we need to look at is, uh, we need to at least keep in mind uh, is the intangible effects of this ballot design. So the, the goal of the ballot is not often only to get the highest possible welfare. So we were uh, talking to the Barcelona participatory budgeting team uh, in trying to deploy some of our, uh, our, our algorithms uh, in practice in Barcelona PB. And one thing that they mentioned is that knapsack votes, which is what they've been using in the past, uh, they might be bad in terms of generating high social welfare, but they are good in this other aspect, which is they help voters understand the limitations imposed by the budget. So if you ask voters to just approve all the projects that they like at at least a certain level, they are probably going to select maybe 15 or 20 projects and when the city at the end executes only three of them, the voters are going to be frustrated because they are going to think that the city is being very inefficient. Okay? But with knapsack votes, they can essentially see in this very nice interface uh, that they can start putting projects in and they can see the budget immediately filling up and they can understand that given this budget, it isn't really possible to execute more than three or four projects at the same time. So, so these kind of effects we should also uh, take into consideration when talking to practitioners. Okay. Another direction is to, uh, and this is something that I've talked to many people about and uh, this is something that we really need, is to get out of this sort of uh, very restricted view of voting where we get all the preferences, we aggregate them and we output the, the winner. Because this is not how voting works in the real world. For example, if you look at participatory budgeting, there is the final voting stage, but there are a lot of things that happen before it. There is a stage where the, the residents are invited to, uh, pro, uh, to provide project proposals. Then there are, there are a couple of stages of community discussions where these projects are filtered and then the final voting stage happens. And how these earlier stages are executed is definitely going to impact the social welfare generated in the end. So you want sort of an all encompassing analysis of this process. And another thing is we should extend this to different models of democracy like uh, liquid democracy, representative democracy. So with some other collaborators we have a 2019 AAAI paper where we look at uh, the comparing the primary based uh, election system where in the US instead of uh, all the candidates competing in a single election, each party holds an internal primary and then elects one candidate that goes into the general election and then voters only vote over these candidates in the general election. And we compare whether this is better or whether having a single direct election is better by again using this distortion framework. Finally, uh, there is need for uh, voting theorists to go out and, and talk to people who are doing some kind of voting uh, in the real world uh, and, and deploy some of these mechanisms. So uh, Ashish Goel's team uh, at Stanford have, has done some pretty fantastic work in trying to deploy some of the uh, participatory budgeting based approaches to cities like uh, Cambridge and, and New York and, uh, and uh, San Francisco. And uh, with my collaborator, uh, Ariel Prokacha, we also have this website, RoboVote, where we deploy some of these distortion based approaches to voting and then let people make uh, real life decisions uh, for voting uh, based on these approaches. Thank you. I guess there's maybe a minute or so for more questions. Uh, if I look at it, it's beyond two digit, here is results beyond social. <coughs>
Right, so we try to think about this. So initially we were looking at, yeah, so we were looking at L1 samplers, which is essentially you just uh, sample something with probability proportional to, uh, to its social welfare. And it turns out that this is not enough. L1 sampler does not give you enough information. L2 sampler does. We didn't look at uh, P more than two. Also, uh, the results that we know for perfect L2 samplers are much stronger than the results that we know for P more than two, uh, because P equal to two turns out to be a very special case, uh, which is not a surprise. So, so yeah, so we just use this, but, but it's an interesting question whether uh, you can use uh, LP samplers for P more than two for this purpose as well. Uh, for case selection, mm -hmm. um, I mean, like, like a more general thing would be participatory budget, right? Right. So, yeah. So, so it, uh, yeah. So I didn't mention this, but it turns out that there is also an easy reduction uh, from participatory budgeting to case selection, where you can essentially uh, bucket the the projects based on their cost. So you can create exponential buckets of cost, and then within each bucket, uh, you can select the right number of uh, alternatives. If their their costs only differ by a factor of let's say two within that bucket then essentially there is a, 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 an obvious K that you can select and it's going to give you the right approximation. So there is an obvious reduction from K selection, so sorry, from participatory budgeting to K selection where you can use any K selection rule and essentially get the same distortion in the participatory budgeting context up to some extra logarithmic factors. So, so there is no good reason for doing that. It's just one of the very uh, standard choices in the literature. Uh, in, in fact, uh, for voting, uh, I, I would even say that social welfare function is probably not a very good choice because it, it goes towards uh, satisfying the majority, uh, right? Because you want to uh, always elect candidates uh, that, 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 that are satisfied by the majority. For k equal to one, this is not so much of a problem. Uh, it's probably uh, um, because, because you, you are not, uh, uh, you, you cannot satisfy the majority and the minority at the same time. For, for k higher than 2, this is the very reason that we went for this max formulation of the, the value that a voter has for a committee, so that when you select the, the optimal committee of, let's say, size 2, you want to select one candidate that, that appeases uh, this half of the population, but you want another candidate that appeases that half of the population. Even if this is 51 voters, that is 49 voters, you don't want two candidates that both appease uh, these 51 voters. So you can kind of fix it. Uh, the, this unfairness of the social welfare function, you can kind of fix it by having this max formulation. But again, sort of what these uh, really mean more principally and more fundamentally, uh, that's, that's left to be explored. Right, so, uh, so they are quite dependent in the sense that, for example, when we are using the sketching algorithms, the sketching algorithms are defined for these updates that sum up. Right, so we have this x that is formed by x1 plus x2 plus dot 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 xn, and the sketching algorithms are defined for this very specific kind of uh, setting. Uh, so if you have a, a different kind of social welfare function, and I'm not sure that these sketching algorithms would go through unless it has a transformation. So if you can take log of all the utilities, and then you can add up the utilities. So if you look at something like Nash welfare, uh, then you can just take the log transformation, and then you can apply these algorithms, and it might work out. Uh, but something that doesn't have a transformation to social welfare. Uh, that might be more difficult. Thank you.